I'm Tom Phillip from Australia, and I'm simply going to share a story with you, which which is sort of our story, but it's actually it's actually not my story. It's Storm's story, and Storm chose her own name. You've turned up here to find Addison is not easy. I, I had difficulty finding Addison, but probably some of you have been here before. Yes, right. And to simply have come to him for emerging from the inner storm might mean nothing to you. I hope by the end of this, when I share the story, it'll mean a lot to you. Because I'm going to share a story with you which is pretty much this person's story. It's a story of 32 years of severe domestic violence and abuse. And it's a story of a discovery of logotherapy and personal recovery. It came about because I first met Storm on the 7th of November 2012. She remembers her dates very well. She's a very organised person. And she, it was a lovely meeting because she came in on her walker. She has severe ataxia as a result of 32 years of living with domestic violence. And so she's very light sensitive. She wears dark glasses. She also can't hold things very well. So one of the challenges that she had was that she does get embarrassed when she drops cups of coffee. She can hear, that's quite reasonable, but she can't readily work with touching pieces of paper, for instance. She's very good with a, um, an iPad. That's her way of communicating with the world. But I don't hand her pieces of paper because she's chemically sensitive and that affects her badly. But I can remember when she first came in, it was quite cute. She looked at me and she said, I'm glad to see you. I wanted an old counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> I took that on the chin <laughs> and we moved on. I hadn't realised that what she did, this only came out later, but she'd actually engaged with that particular service. We, we, I worked with the, the service a few days a week, three days a week in Brisbane. And she'd engaged with that service on email, because we do offer an email counselling service. And she's very good on the iPad at finding things. So she found this and she said, I'm going to see if I can talk to an email counsellor. And she did. And she talked to an email counsellor for quite a few times. But then at the end of that, she said, I might go and see this person face to face. And when she did, she discovered this was not the person that she wanted. Not because of anything wrong with the person. Wonderful counsellor. It's a colleague of mine. But she said, I looked at this person. I hadn't realised who they were on email. And I said to myself, you could be my daughter. And I have lots of things I want to tell you, but I can't tell these sorts of things to my daughter. So I want an old counsellor. <laughs> Apparently when you get old, you can hear these stories. That, was, that seems to be the theory. So this is her story, and it's very much her story, because what I actually said to her, after we'd been working together for a while, I said, I'd love to tell you a story. I'm going to a conference one of these days, and I want to tell you a story. And she said, yes, yes, if my story helps other people, tell my story. So I said, I will. I said, I won't write a paper, but what I'll do is produce a set of slides, PowerPoint slides, and I'll talk to them. And she said, that'd be good. And a couple of weeks later, she sent me an email, a set of PowerPoint slides, and said, <laughs> how about these? <laughs> this might be my story. And so I said, yeah, yeah that's good, that, that looks good. <clears throat> Except slides are slides. They don't tell me what you meant. They summarise things for you. So I'd better talk with you about your slides. And she said, yes, yes, OK. So she came in specially one, one time when I was there. I only, come, I only go there Fridays. So she came in specially one Friday and she said, I'm here to talk about the slides. She went through slide by slide and she said, why don't you interview me? <laughs> and I said, yeah, let's interview you. So a little bit like Marshall up the front here, I had one of these devices and I said, 
you, why don't you talk to the slums? And so she does. So a lot of what we do, it will in fact be storms talking to the slums. And she began her story in a very different way to what I would. You see, I have the affliction of having a first degree in pure mathematics, so I tend to, I can be a logical thinker. I try not to be a logical thinker, but I can be a logical thinker. And so I would have told this story very differently. She started here, almost at the end to me, because she tried in this slide to recognise the real changes that she'd made and the level that she'd made them at. So, we'll see if we can get it. Estelle, just looking at that first slide, we're going to introduce you to an audience and they've never met you before. I would have put this together very differently, telling the story from the beginning. You've chosen mm. to tell it almost at the end. Mm. What was behind your thinking? Well, um, when I came into counselling on the 2nd of November, um, I'd say I was right for counselling. Uh, like, uh, I was beginning to realise that I had a lot of, um, you know, deep scars uh, and I had only seen the external damage and uh, uh, when I have been in counselling earlier times uh, I talked about it uh, as if it was just sort of on television, the news, you know. Uh, I talked about something and when I came into counselling on the 2nd of November uh, I got into my soul, you could say. My understanding of logotherapy from my wide reading um, informed me um, about the um, importance of values in life and the meaning of life, the meaning of suffering, and uh, it uh, showed me that um, there's a purpose in life and it helped me to uh, accept what had happened to me without condoning what had happened to me. We don't do logotherapy. I don't talk to clients and say, now I'm going to do some logotherapy with you. I'll tell you the story of Storm and Logotherapy later. She's very good at iPads and Google. But this is what she actually said, and she had read Man's Search for Meaning by this time, by the time she talks about this slide. And she said, this is an email to me, like my liberation from domestic violence is the title of the email. I've considered my own experience of that final liberation from the horrors of domestic violence as I read Frankel's account of the psychology of men liberated from the World War II camps. One, I had lost the ability to feel pleased and I'm having to relearn it slowly. I did not feel freedom as I was expected to. My desire to talk about what I'd endured became compelling but people gave a so what response. What I needed was to be able to feel again. I knew very little about myself on liberation and step by step I'm slowly becoming a human being again with feelings. I was under enormous mental pressure for so long when the pressure was released with a sudden separation from the oppressor, I was left with a deep sense of emptiness, not the longed for sense of freedom and happiness. I justified my attitude and behaviour towards others, although in significant events, by my own terrible experiences. Slowly I have had to learn to guide myself back to understand that just because I was treated badly, that did not give me permission to treat others unkindly. 
I thought I'd reached the limit of my sufferings just to realise I could still suffer more and still more intensely with no possibility of comfort of mind ahead. I was not prepared for unhappiness on liberation. Looking back on 32 years of domestic abuse, I could not understand how I endured it at all. So we move on. <coughs> at one stage I said, just in one of our sessions, have you managed to forgive yourself? It was just a question. It throws people, it threw storm. What's this thing about forgiveness? I don't forgive him. But the question resonated with her. And I had suggested to her that she might do some forgiveness. She says this about her painting. She'll talk to it in a moment. She sent me an email. An act of compassion towards myself. I forgave him on the 26th of January 2013. Deep bitterness would destroy any hope of my full recovery to a happy life. I felt an awareness of being clean after the act of forgiveness, although I had no awareness of not being clean prior. I also felt relief it was over. Art therapy was the tool that helped me to accomplish this. She's an artist and a poet. I painted what I felt. She, she shows one of them. <coughs> Picture him with fist raised. Picture him suffering in jail. Picture him suffering in hell. There is just me left now to reconstruct. In slide three, I can remember asking you at one stage whether you'd forgiven yourself and you came back to me with this poster. Well, I still don't feel I need to forgive myself um, for adhering to my values during the marriage, um, but uh, I discovered in therapy, um, uh, well, therapy really brought the bitterness and the resentment to the head and it was so uncomfortable uh, you know inside of me uh, I just couldn't bear it anymore and that pushed me forward uh, to forgive him uh, not for him because that's not going to help him um, but for myself and after I had forgiven him uh, the pain uh, subsided inside of me. This is a beautiful piece of work, this poem here. And possibly you can't read it from where you are. I hope you can, because I don't want to read things that you can already read. But she sent me an email about this, uh, entitled, He broke my head, but he, he did not break my spirit. Paul, this was a strong thought in my mind as I walked with the assistance of two walking sticks along the beachfront at Wynnum. I have this internal drive that compels me to do such, which I don't understand. She wrote this at the night of one, on the night of one of her most severe attacks. And she went upstairs and wrote this to herself. I have high regard for you. I have awesome respect for you. I delight in you. I plan fulfilling days for you. I give you creative activities to enjoy doing. I give you enjoyable moments. I have faith, hope, and faith in you. And when she showed me these things, I kept talking to her about how she had been able to overcome this in her own life already. The final step was going out the door. And as she said, I kept saying to myself, you have to keep going, you have to keep going, when she decided to leave. I'm going to go back because I missed one and I've had that in front of you and I should have mentioned this to you. This is interesting because this is a, one of, uh, my original doctorate work was in religious experience. And this is akin to a religious experience. The 12th of October was so special for her because it was the date of the final assault 
but it was also the date of new life, the birth of her granddaughter. And she meshed the two together. <coughs> and I'll come back to the religious experience side a little bit later on because she has a more profound experience again. And this is the, this is the yeah. grandchild? Yes. Um, I have always found uh, the 12th of October every year uh, a traumatic anniversary for me because on that day my whole life changed. Um, I couldn't walk the same, I couldn't eat the same, couldn't clean my teeth and um, my granddaughter uh, chose to be born on the 12th of October which made it a new day for me. So I no longer dread the 12th of October uh, each year anymore. Um, uh, it, it, it's just wonderful how, you know, life has a way of giving you little gifts. And that was a gift really from life. And this one. Now this is, to me, one of the most important pieces of poetry because I remember you telling me that you wrote poetry and the story behind this particular piece is so significant. Yes, on this particular night, after uh, my ex-husband had uh, already given me brain damage and maimed me, uh, told me that I had been a leech and that I had been a leech all our married life, and rather than let what he said destroy me, I went straight and wrote this poem to myself to validate who I was. Uh, so it was my way of fighting back, uh, you know, to uh, preserve myself. She frames these, she brings them along, that's a photo of it. And, and then I have a habit of whatever we do in a therapy session, if it's something that we've worked on, if it's on the whiteboard, if it's something we've taken a photo of, I, I send people an email to say, this is what we did, don't forget this. And uh, because she's so good at the iPad, she kept all these, that's how she put them together. And this is where she discovered logotherapy. Because she's so good at the iPad work, she decided, Who's this old person that I'm talking to? We'd been working for a few sessions and she decided to find me. Well, she did. She found me. She found the web page. She found, oh, this is a logotherapy person. Oh dear, I better find out what this logotherapy is about. And so she then started to Google logotherapy and she picked up various materials. She bought some things along that I'd never seen, but she downloaded from the web. And she said, this is actually quite good. Have you read this? And I said, no, I haven't read that. Have you read Man's Search for Meaning? And she hadn't even heard of it. So then she said, OK, I'll find that. So she went Googling and she said, I can download this for free. <laughs> Which she did and she started to read it. So this is a long story. So there she is with the walker. And the trauma of constant fear uh, is replaced by having to cope with just the physical challenges but now she has something <clears throat> that she can work with. It's interesting that you discovered logotherapy for yourself as I can remember when you came to tell me about some things on the web that you discovered in logotherapy that was the beginning. Yes, uh, well um I don't listen to Dr. Frankel because he's a doctor. I listen to him because um, he has been through the testing, you could say. And he's a chap that's been uh, really tested by um, uh, terrible events that are equivalent uh, to domestic violence. Uh, in domestic violence, a woman's face can be completely blown off and um, so I listened to him as someone who has experienced similar things to myself uh, to different degrees. 
That was the walker. Now this is a symbol of growth. I remember the day she came along and she didn't have the walker. She said, have you seen my new walking sticks? She'd made them, um, the little skiing sticks there. She said, I can go faster on these. <laughs> I just can't, and I have, but I have to have some sort of backpack on me because I can't carry all the stuff I need, but I can go faster on these. And I, I'm feeling more confident that I can keep walking. So moving from that to this is almost a symbol of just accepting change. And she'll talk a little bit about accepting change. After the separation, when I uh, left with a disability, um, people used to say, just get on with my life. And I used to think, um, how do I get on with, with this life? I don't know how to live this life. Uh, I've never had a life with a disability. And I found that um, you know, allowing myself to accept a little bit of help, which is my walkers uh, and uh, walking sticks, um, I can... Uh, Im improve my life and uh, 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 be able to, you know, go further in an outing. Uh, so um, uh, the the walkers are really part of my uh, changed life. And then she did this little thing. <laughs> the screams of storms, little children remain. It's interesting. The the two children that she has, didn't know anything about domestic violence. It was a big house, and they may have seen it in early stages when they were very young, 18 months old, but she said, we hit, I hid it from them. So it all took place upstairs. And so they would never really, they saw the black eye occasionally, but you had to sort of explain that. But they didn't really see the violence itself. I saw this piece of uh, art and it uh, brought to my mind logotherapy, how it um, encourages us uh, to move forward and onwards in spite of uh, what we have been through. And then she wrote this, she called it liberation. Slowly but surely myself re-emerging, counselling hours, Pain purging, feeling surging. Slowly but surely, life re-emerging. Counselling hours. Injuries purging. Carefree surging. Slowly but surely, emotions re-emerging. Counselling hours. Trauma purging. Life purpose surging. Slowly but surely, gains re-emerging. Counselling hours. Losses purging. Happiness surging. Slowly but surely, future re-emerging. Counselling hours, logotherapy purging. Knowledge surging. And this is beautiful. <laughs> this is absolutely beautiful. This, this has a long story because at one stage I got an email to say, I really want to ride a bike because I used to be able to ride a bike and I could ride it for miles, but I have a taxi and I'm really afraid that I'll fall off the bike. And if I fall off the bike, I will injure myself. I'm just afraid to get on. By this stage, she'd done Man's Search for Meaning, she'd read a lot about logotherapy, and she finished her little email by saying, I think I need paradoxical intention, don't I? <laughs> I didn't have the chance to answer because a couple of hours later she sent this picture. <laughs> and basically what she said was, um, she won't say this in a moment, but, but what she said in the email was, I've turned this thing on its head. They ought to call this wow therapy. But she'd got on the bike and she decided to ride. I took this photo of this elephant standing on its head because it reminded me that um, domestic violence had virtually turned me upside down 
and uh, my engagement with logotherapy has gradually uh, turned me around and up the right way. And when she moved, she moved. Um, that was one part of the city. <coughs> This is across the river in another part of the city. And she's into photos. That was the day, by the way, that this is, in the, this is the mall in the centre of the city. And uh, that day they had a scare with somebody with a plastic gun had been running around and so they closed the whole thing off, etc. And she missed all that. I think she might have been disappointed she missed it, but she basically said, I even, avoid the, I even avoided the gunman in the mall. But she sent the photo. So when she moved, she really did decide that she was ready to move. But there's a symbolism in this. I took this photo when I was out on my bike because it made me think that logotherapy uh, has uh, pointed me towards uh, believing that I had a life after domestic violence. It might be a different life, but I have a life. And there's this. This has a story. You see, and you know this, that severe trauma, of course, creates its own problems in terms of flashbacks and dreams and nightmares, etc. And that's what this is really about, because this is about the fear that she has of just going to sleep. Because she's concerned that sleep brings on the flashbacks and the dreams and everything else. And so this is really about that fear that she has. This is really about some of the flashbacks yeah. that domestic violence of yeah. this yeah. level can cause. Yeah. Um, I used to avoid going to bed, put it off as long as possible uh, because of the the nightmares I had about him where he was in the seat of power and um, uh, attempting to take my children off me and I found that listening to these audio meditations on self-compassion helped me to get over that negativity about going uh, to bed. Uh, yeah. Now, despite the fact that we developed a strong relationship, <coughs> there were some things she couldn't tell me. She didn't feel comfortable with. And in order to be able to talk about those things, she started, she, she used the iPad and she Googled again and she found someone uh, who was in South Africa who was doing experimenting from the University of South Africa and they were experimenting with email counselling about logotherapy. So she was happy, I've got someone in logotherapy and I've also got someone I can email to and talk about some things. What she didn't tell me, well she told me actually because she used to send me transcripts of the emails. <laughs> this was her way of telling me stuff that she couldn't talk about face to face. And she sent me the email and what it was, it was a, it was a fear of wearing dresses. She was really afraid, and, and, and I didn't realise this because she'd never told me, and she'd never worn a dress whenever I'd seen her. So she began this interaction, and that's how I started to realise, well, that's how I knew that there was a fear of actually wearing a dress, and that this could be a problem for her. And you began to engage on email with a logotherapist in South Africa. Yes. Uh, and um, um, we talked by email uh, on my fears of wearing skirts uh, and dresses in that I felt very vulnerable um, because uh, my ex always finished off the, uh, the assaults with uh, rape and I was just afraid it would happen again. So I was able to uh, identify that fear and it lost a lot of its power over me. I mean, you, you have to wonder, why would somebody stay 32 years? She took a marriage vow 
and she had children. That's what usually happens. She does question herself now whether that was a good decision, but that was the re that was the reality. She stayed faithful. She stayed. She kept transcending herself and not seeing the transcendence in some ways. She emailed me then to say um, after I after she sent the email about the dresses, etc. She said, I might surprise you next time. So next time she turned up in a dress. And she'd actually said to her email counsellor, I, I think I might go and surprise them. I'm not sure whether I can face this or not. But she turned up in a dress. So the next time I saw her, there she was. Um, and this, sort of, this poem sort of says the whole lot for you. DB survive a wish, she called this. I want to thrive, not just survive, but amazingly alive, new self arrive. I want to know much more than the average Joe, everything to know. I want to feel much more than a dried up old orange peel. I want to think, not just blink. Knowledge link, not just sink. I want to love, no boxing gloves. Be as gentle as a dove. This is the sadness. Her previous counsellor, who's a wonderful person, but too young to tell some of these things too when they see when she saw them face to face. This is the child that she lost from the punch from her husband. And the child the child aborted and was flushed down the toilet. And when she said that to him, and his only response was you're trying to get me into trouble, aren't you? And she wrote this poem, which possibly you can't read, so I might read it for you. My little one nestled in my womb, you did no wrong to deserve to lose your precious, your precious life to an angry hiss. I did no wrong to deserve to lose your precious life to an angry hiss. Hopes and dreams dash forever to hold you, to care for you, imagine for you, plan for you, your life disposed of by your father's hand. How can a father kill his child, I ask? To understand is a mighty task. Her previous counsellor encouraged her to write that. And this particular grieving was really important for her. Now this is an important yes. issue because this was the loss of a child mm. because of domestic violence. Yes. Um, I wrote this poem uh, and presented it uh, to give um, some respect towards uh, the child I lost and um, to show my love for the lost child. And when I was punched in the stomach, uh, I didn't know that that happened to other women as well. So I virtually thought, this only happens to me, nobody else in the world. And uh, I think this assault is the one that most destroyed me. She put these things in because I send them things that we do, right? So this is just a, a we do some work on the whiteboard at one stage. I like the whiteboard. The reason I like the whiteboard is it gives us a record sometimes, but also what you find is that, and I don't always use it by the way, but what you do find is that if you start to record things, we just decided to record a little bit of the, of the life summary. If you start to record things like that, people concentrate, they turn, you can see their chair move and they're actually self-distancing. They're looking at their life from a distance. Mm -hmm. And we often look at some of the most challenging and most beautiful events. She wrote a few things. We did nothing special. We hadn't talked about logotherapy, but she talked about some of the things that had been part of her life, including the fact that she had two sons. One son uh, stays in contact with her, the other son 
and they hadn't seen any of the domestic violence, doesn't really believe all this happened and is very negative towards him. And in fact, um, fairly, very, very much attacked her after she left the home. And that's very sad. And so she, when she talks about it, <coughs> she grieves and the tears flow. <coughs> and we did this. I mean, we, we just did this. As I said, sometimes it helps to talk about some of the things that you've done in the past. You know, where have you created things? Because on the issue did poetry. We talked a little bit, you'll see on the right hand side there, about this the whole concept that you've got this spirit that can overcome things. And all that's okay. They're, they're, they're just little summaries of what we were doing. And notice that she she keeps the dates. She, if you actually follow through, she's kept the dates. This was fairly early. But this was the one. <laughs> when you do this sort of work, people take away from a counselling session whatever they take away. You don't know that. And in between sessions, a lot happens. This is the one she wanted to talk about. <coughs> and I can't do art. You can tell that. No? That's supposed to be a fern. Ferns grow that way. No? You can sort of see it, but gee, it's not well done. <laughs> but she loved that. And she took that away. And this has meant so much to her in terms of... Uh, what it's all about. Like she says, I used to have my feelings blunted. Now one of the stories she tells against herself, her feelings were so blunted that at one stage she went off to church, not just the church, but the main cathedral in the, in the centre of the city, and she went there for, for Mass. She was, she, she was a Methodist originally, but her husband was a Catholic, and so she changed to, to become a Catholic and stayed with him 32 years. You often wonder, who was the faithful Catholic? But anyway, she, she goes up to church and she said, and I was, sitting in the, I was sitting in the church and I thought, my yogurt is getting hot. I'm going to eat my yogurt. And so as the priest was talking, she's eating the yogurt. And I said, well, that would have seemed strange down the back of the cathedral. She said, oh, no, it was the front seat. <laughs> <laughs> but she uh, basically starts to say, well, this, is, this meant so much to her because she feels that now I'm finding my life again. And this is very important, yes. even though the diagram is very simple. Mm -hmm. I didn't realise until I was in uh, uh, therapy that my feelings had been blunted. Uh, I couldn't even feel for my children. Uh, I just had nothing there and um, slowly I have had to learn how to feel again and um, how to operate in feelings again. Hmm. And she put this slide in, we don't have a chance to really depth that because we're going to run out of time for not care, but we've got about 10 minutes. But she did this. She did this one after she started to wear the dresses, getting in touch with her inner self. She starts to see that she's moved in the logotherapy area and she's now working in the noetic dimension. She doesn't name it quite in quite that way, but it is getting in touch with her inner self. So this is the inner self one, which yeah. you... This is a poem, I, I was encouraging you to write poems as well, and this is yeah. a poem that you wrote. Yeah. Uh, when you felt that you were coming out of things? Yeah, uh, this poem I wrote at a time in therapy when I was starting to um, get in touch with who I was inside and um, uh, writing the poem was good therapy in itself. And because she was good at this, I actually asked her because I, I used this little piece from Michael Lunick, who's a cartoonist and also a little a writer uh, in Australia. And this is a little poem that he wrote. Uh, and I said, I, I like this because it's a really a good logotherapy poem, but it's not really nice because it's just words. Can you help me to illustrate it? So she did. Go to the end of the, of the path until you get to the gate. <coughs> Go through the gate and head straight out towards the horizon. 
keep going towards the horizon. Sit down and have a rest every now and again. But keep on going. Just keep on with it. Keep going as far as you can. That's how you get there. And she illustrated that, and these days, occasionally, um, I'll send that out to someone an email to say, this might be something you want to look at, talk about, think about, and see whether that works for you. How to get there. Yeah. Uh, I think in uh, counselling, when you enter counselling, uh, as you progress, it can become very uncomfortable for you for your stomach even, and you can be very tempted to uh, think um, uh, this is enough, I don't want to go through any more. Um, but if you keep going, it's like you come out at the end of the tunnel and uh, you're a better person for it and you have a better life. And here she is on Anzac Day. Anzac Day is a special day in our country because it's the the day we commemorate, uh, the cynical side of me, it's the day we commemorate when Australia and New Zealand combined have invaded Turkey. And uh, we commemorate that day and they have marches there that are not meant to be nationalistic in many ways but just uh, in, in some ways commemorating people who have made sacrifices over time and she's gone on the march and she's made it. And there she is having made it. The Antic Day March. Yeah, I decided to march uh, behind my walker for this Anzac Day um, because it felt to me like a culmination of all the work I had done in, uh, in counselling. Um, I didn't even know if I'd finished the walk and there was a couple of times during the walk that I felt uh, I couldn't go on any further uh, but, uh, you know, that striving was still inside of me. So I gritted my teeth, not physically, but emotionally, and finished the march. And I, I got uh, so much validation uh, for doing that from myself coming to terms with a new life. She's moved from a, a large house that had everything to being on a pension and living in assisted government accommodation. She has started with nothing. She's moved cities in order to be completely away from the, the person and she started with nothing. And she has to come to terms with that. So doing up this little living area, this little flat that she lives in, um, was creativity unblocked for her. And by that stage, she'd begun to take charge of what we were doing, but we let her talk first. Um, this photo of my creativity um, tells quite a story. Um, after I left the marital home, I had a blockage to writing, to writing poetry, um, I just couldn't uh, let myself go free and be creative because it was like all my creativity was still locked in that home and during the process of the counselling uh, I've been able to um, take possession of that uh, creativity and begin afresh. Uh, where I am at now. She didn't only take possession of the flat, she took possession of the counselling sessions. Because she used to send me an email beforehand to say, I've decided that next time I meet with you we want to talk about this. <laughs> and she sent me this email at one stage, which she didn't actually keep faith with, but she said, I'd like to let you know that I, should need, that I shouldn't need any further counselling after our next session in the light of the achievements I've gained. I would like my final counselling session to reflect on the achievements and then she lists them. Light-hearted, less serious, enjoyment of life, accepted ataxia limits, let go of former self, accepted my clumsiness, 
shed tears for past abuse, gratefulness, thankfulness, feel empathy and compassion, graciousness, forgave the husband, self-compassion, sacrament of confession, to become a Catholic, rally for pro-life, 2nd of February 2013. Frankel ebook, World War II, Good Life Installation. And she said this will be the final counselling session. And then when she worked out that in fact she hadn't reached her government regulated limit, she said, oh, we'll keep going until we get there then. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. What we actually settled on eventually <coughs> was that I said, well, uh, we, we can't, we do, we do have a limit, so we probably will meet one more time now. And then once the year rolls over, once you've been away 12 months, you can re-engage if you want to, but we're a particular type of service, so you have to tell a story that, that is able to be addressed by our service. So I said, look, we've got a course online, you might want to do this, because you, you're good at Googling. <coughs> and you can do your stuff creatively. So she started the course online. Part of the course online is in the first module, um, we have some Frankel videos, and that's what she's saying at the bottom there. She said, she's watched the four videos. It's a life experience to see and hear the man who is enabled in his inner self to survive the almost impossible, she says. Humbling <coughs> kind of met. But she met, she meant more than that. She sent me an email later on. She talked in person about this. She said, this is the kind of stuff I don't understand with my mortal brain, but I sense Dr. Frankel's presence, that he knew my struggles, not knew about my struggles, from the information he gained while living him being. So she felt him there while she watched him on the video. I'm certain that he has a present life now, but a different life to what he had when he was a living, living human being. I've never experienced any such encounter ever in my life, and I know I should, we should not look for such things to happen. I'm going out on a limb sharing this personal encounter. Most of us don't share these things. When it happens, it's quite common for people to have experiences that you might interpret as being religious, but most people don't share them. <coughs> I'm trying to put it in an understandable framework. Hope I won't be in your bad books because this encounter happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, actually, one of my great studies is religious experience, and that's what I'm interested in. She always has the last word. I actually said, and Storm's journey continues, and she looked at that, and eventually she came back and said, and I want to put this at the end as well, And Storm's journey continues, she put the rest in. And that's Storm's story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing.